Good evening from Singapore. I'm Kong Yun Fong, Vice Dean for Research and Development and Professor of Political Science at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. It is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this book launch, which I will moderate. We are celebrating and launching Rivers of Iron, Railroads and Chinese Power in Southeast Asia, a University of California press book by Professor David M. Lampton, Selena Ho, and Cheng Chui Quick. Many of you will know Mike Lampton, currently Professor Emeritus at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced and International Studies, where he has had a distinguished career that included a long stint as Dean of Faculty. He has written some of the most important books on China and on US-China relations, and among my favorites are his 2008, The Three Faces of Chinese Power, Might, Money, and Minds, and his 2001, Same Bed, Different Dreams, Managing US-China Relations. Mike has, of course, also trained many of the world's best China scholars. His two co-authors, Selena and Cheng Chui, are among his former students, having worked with him on their doctoral dissertations at SAES. Selena Ho is currently my colleague and assistant professor at the school, where she teaches courses on Asian security and foreign policy analysis. Rivers of Iron follows hot on the hills of the 2019 Cambridge University Press book, Thirsty Cities, a fascinating comparative study using social contract theory to examine the provision of public goods by China and India. The third author, Ching Chui Quick, is Associate Professor and Head of the Center for Asian Studies at the Institute of Malaysian and International Studies, National University of Malaysia, or UKM, as it is uh, known. Ching Chui is known for his work on strategic hedging, how small and middle powers try not to be drawn too far into the orbits of competing great powers. More than anybody else, he has deepened our understanding of this phenomenon through a series of uh, important writings. Given the state of US-China relations today, with each of the superpowers trying to get the ASEAN countries to align with them, I can imagine that business will remain brisk for Cheng Chui in the years to come. Now, that brings me to the work we are here to discuss today, Rivers of Iron. For those of us who have been observing China's rise and the implications for the region and for the world, I think we have had to grapple with China's Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, uh, formally launched by President Xi Jinping in 2013. While she had framed the BRIs as something that promotes transnational connectivity, reminiscent perhaps of the old Silk Road, uh, some critics have argued that uh, it is part of a larger strategy in pursuit of global dominance. So what is it really? I agree with the authors of Rivers of Iron that the debate cannot be settled at the abstract or ideological level. A better and more rigorous approach is to examine a key concrete manifestation of that initiative. Mike, Selena, and Cheng Chui chose to study the planning and execution of the inter-country railway system connecting China and seven of its Southeast Asian neighbors, including Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. Their analysis illuminates the political strengths and weaknesses of the BRI, as well as the uh, capability of the countries concerned to do what they can to shape, to resist, and perhaps even take advantage of China's uh, policies. So before I hand over the floor to the authors, I thought I'll just share with you my favorite part uh, of the book. Uh, and uh, I have to read it to you, all right? It's the table of contents. Chapter one, Chinese power is Chinese power does. Two, the grand vision. Chapter three, China's debates. 
Chapter 4, diverse Southeast Asian responses. 5, the negotiating tables, China and Southeast Asia. 6, project implementation, the devil is in the details. 7, geopolitics and geoeconomics. Chapter 8, implications for China, Asia and the world. I guess what I'm trying to say is that few books lay out in the table of contents the major strengths of their argument as clearly and as succinctly as this one. I admire the way the authors have foregrounded the unfolding story for us in the table of contents, right? And hinted at the key dynamics in play and what it means for the region. If I were a PhD student taking my oral exam, and if I were asked, have I read the book? I think I can persuade my examiners that I have just by reciting the table of contents. So without embarrassing the authors anymore, allow me to hand over the Zoom stage to Professor David Mike Lampton for him and his co-authors to regale you with their key findings. Over to you, Mike. Well, uh, thank you so much. And on behalf of my uh, uh, co our co the three co-authors, uh, Selena Ho and Chung Chui, I want to thank uh, Dean Kong for those uh, gracious remarks. And... Um, uh, the comment on the table of contents. I, I agree that that pretty well lays out the uh, flow of argument and the major uh, topics. Um, also want to thank uh, uh, Lee Wee Lip uh, for all the help he has uh, provided us in getting this program physically produced and uh, up on the screen. Uh, I want to wish all of you a, a good evening if you're in Singapore and a, if you're in the uh, West uh, in the United States, uh, as I am, uh, a good morning to everybody. Uh, I also want to thank the Lee Guan Yu School not only for this uh, uh, efforts on, on this program specifically, but it, the university was also helpful uh, to us in the course of researching uh, this, uh, this book, not the least we went to a conference uh, at this school uh, in the course of our research. Also want to thank the uh, University of California Press for producing uh, in this age, cost-conscious age, what I think is a very uh, beautiful book and thank the editor there, uh, Reed Malcolm, for all his help on this book and others. Also, because of the magnitude that uh, Dean Kung pointed to in terms of geographic scope, seven Southeast Asian countries on the continent uh, and Singapore, uh, also add uh, Indonesia, which comes into the story, and of course, China. So the scope, uh, geographic and um, uh, substantive, is enormous, and that meant we needed funding. And I want to thank uh, the Smith Richardson Foundation for the necessary resources, SICE, uh, my home school and uh, Stanford University all contributed financially to making this, this possible. Um, as this book uh, was uh, nearing its end stage, of course, there was, was and is lots of talk, uh, particularly in the wake of COVID, but also the what you might call fallout in U.S.-China relations, a lot of talk about decoupling. And uh, while it, I, I think, is probably inevitable, there will be some diversification of supply chains, uh, some move away from um, a high degree in all, uh, particularly in strategic areas on China's uh, in the supply chain. Nonetheless, uh, we are committed to the proposition that connectivity and interdependence aren't dead. And indeed, the uh, book is uh, dedicated to the proposition that building connections the is the future and building walls is the past. So that was sort of our, our motivating spirit uh, in this uh, uh, five-year-long process. Now, the book is in part about how China acquired the technology, finance, a human and human resources to, first of all, create a high-speed rail industry at home. Secondly, how to build, uh, how they built a high-speed rail system very rapidly within China, and then how they built the organizations and created the entrepreneurial spirit to begin to export this, uh, this capability, in this case, high and uh, conventional speed rail exports to the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, 
there's often, I think, the implicit idea that China has an idea and it, uh, so to speak, shoves it down the throat of uh, other countries. In this case, what we are looking at is the implementation of a connect rail connectivity vision that was really uh, started uh, by the colonialists in parts of Southeast Asia, most importantly, the, the British and the French. Uh, and then in the after uh, the uh, World War II and decolonialization and the uh, beginnings of uh, um, more modern economic development in the region, then uh, this vision was adopted by the countries themselves. And as late as 1999, 2000, uh, the Chinese really weren't involved. Uh, then Prime Minister Mahathir uh, spoke with Chinese Premier uh, Zhu Rongji, uh, and basically asked if China would participate in uh, uh, finance, development, technology transfer to Southeast Asia to help to implement their vision. At the time, Zhu Rongji said, well, uh, you know, China, it needs its own rail system. We have to develop our own industry. We have many domestic needs. We're not in a position to help. And so it was really only with the convergence of China's build out of its own rail system, the, uh, uh, the acquisition of uh, huge volumes of investment resource and foreign exchange and the technology and building the engineering force and the organizations, both uh, uh, industrial organizations and regulatory in, uh, organizations in the 2000s that allowed China to be responsive when, uh, particularly when Xi Jinping came into office. So what we're looking at, sort of to put it uh, simply and crudely, is there's a train that Southeast Asia conceived of and began to, uh, well, to develop. And China saw the opportunity after 2010, particularly with the rise of Xi Jinping, to use its newly formed capital and technology to help Southeast Asia implement this vision. So the point, I think one of the overriding points of the book is Southeast Asia has agency. It's not just acted upon by China, but in fact, it has the capacity to envision, uh, to negotiate, to play a role in implementation. And therefore, what you have is a more uh, give and take natural political kind of set of relationships. Now, uh, that brings us to this uh, map that is before you. So what is the vision? And you start up that hub in Kunming in southwest China, uh, and you will see arrows radiating uh, all over uh, in various directions. Three of them are going back into China itself, and that connects to both the conventional and high-speed rail system in China. If you look basically uh, southward from Kunming, you will see three lines radiating basically north-south rail lines. One on the uh, western side goes from Kunming to Mandalay, uh, Rangoon, down to Bangkok. Uh, we'll just call that the western line. It's not yet really under construction. Uh, we are all acquainted with all of the problems Burma has in all respects. Uh, so uh, that's more vision for the future, but that's one prong of this three-prong system. If you go back to Kunming and then go directly south, you'll see a line that goes to Vientiane on the uh, Mekong River and then goes through Thailand down to Bangkok. That's the central line. That's relatively advanced. It will reach Vientiane by uh, probably very close to December of this year. Uh, we'll call that the central line. And again, it, it, uh, it, it for the moment, will go to Bangkok eventually. Then you have the uh, go back to Kunming and down to Hanoi and then Ho Chi Minh City, Nam Pen, Bangkok. We'll call that the eastern line. Uh, and there are various pieces of uh, older system railroad that the French built in uh, uh, Vietnam that connect to China, but nothing. this is just, this map represents the high-speed rail system. You will note that the whole system 
at this, as far as I've talked, ends, uh, converges all three lines in Bangkok, and then on one common line goes down the Malay Peninsula to uh, ultimately Singapore through Kuala Lumpur. So each of these lines is longer than the transcontinental railroad in the United States. And we're all familiar, I think, at least broadly speaking, with that ro railroad that was built from 1863 to 1869. Uh, that railroad transformed not only the economy of the United States, it united our country physically, and it made us a Pacific power, along with, I might add, the Panama Canal. Our expectation is that this, uh, this vision that's before you, uh, the most central, the central line is most advanced, but this vision, even the central line, I think will be transformative uh, in terms of the economy and development of much of Southeast Asia. And of course, if all three get built over a long time frame or a longer time frame, uh, it will have genuinely transformative effects geopolitically, economically, urbanization, uh, and uh, so forth. So that's the vision. Now, this study is a little unusual in as most implementation projects look at a completed project and then dissected where did the idea come from, what problems were encountered, and what can you learn from that case. Here, what we have is the what you might call the implementation of a vision over a very long period. And so the story is not over. There's an indeterminacy. They are making progress. They are building. But along the way and in the future, uh, uh, decisions that we don't anticipate now will be made. Elections will change uh, the politics of various lines. Eco economic up and ups and downs will occur. You'll have pandemics that affect things. So this is, a, a, I think, a unique study that looks at an unfolding, very large scale uh, implementation problem. This is, in effect, an implementation study about globalization. So I think that's one of the interesting aspects. Now, one of the what are the macro questions, some of the macro questions we asked? I think in research, it's always good to ask yourself a simple-minded question. Start with a really simple question and then make it more complicated. The simple question is, if this is the vision, can China and its neighbors do it? Now, of course, part of the answer to that question is an engineering question. This is a huge engineering problem. If you look at just uh, the northern part of Laos, 70% uh, of the rail mileage down to Vientiane is bridges and tunnels. And each area of, uh, of all these lines put, uh, presents its own problems. So there, there's certainly the engineering and uh, aspect of it. But the, I think the bigger challenge is political. How, from at least China's point of view, can you induce seven very different countries at different uh, economic levels, different kinds of political systems, systems, different rates of urbanization, uh, different financial capabilities. Uh, how can you induce such a heterogeneous area to uh, undertake the negotiations and undertake the projects that will end up with a single integrated system, uh, which flows smoothly from one nation uh, to the next. So we felt that this is really genuinely a political science question. Basically, can China do it? Uh, how will China's neighbors uh, affect that? And what are going to be the implications geostrategically, geoeconomically, and so on? In short, the book is really going to be uh, in part, or is a, in part, about how this affects global economic uh, and uh, strategic uh, power. That brings us to another uh, major uh, question in the book, and that is how should the West, and, and not least the United States, think about relating to this? I think it's fair to say that 
the United States has generally adopted a fairly skeptical approach, both in terms of its effects uh, and the way in which it, it might be implemented. Uh, I think our view is that the correct strategy for the West is to think about uh, balanced connectivity, not trying to stop China and its partners from creating more connectivity north-south, but to balance that through the construction of east-west connectivity from India through Burma, through Thailand, Laos, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, up to Japan. So build a balanced system that doesn't focus all flows of human resources, capital, uh, and people uh, uh, in a north-south direction, but also balance it in a network on east-west kind of connectivity and create a balance of what you might call uh, not just simply power, but of, of uh, connectivity uh, power. Uh, also, I think a major uh, question the book addresses is, what are the determinants of how different Southeast Asian countries respond to this? As you all, our listeners in uh, Southeast Asia well know, an extremely heterogeneous area. They do not all respond to one another uh, in compatible ways, and they all have their own history and proclivities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. So those are some of uh, the issues I'll uh, wind up and uh, say just simply in terms of our research strategy, covering so much real estate was an enormous uh, task. And we had a really two prongs of our research. One was documentary, local newspapers, government documents, multilateral organization studies, such as the ADB, uh, the World Bank, so forth. Uh, but the second and very large and complex prong of our research was uh, 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 interviews. And uh, we interviewed in about 158 organizations. So you know, I use the word interview loosely. Sometimes they were big meetings. Sometimes they were just discussions as we were walking along a field site, as you see in this picture in Northern Laos in 2017. But the point is that uh, interviews were a very big part of the strategy. We talked to government people in all seven and Southeast Asian countries, plus Indonesia, plus China, obviously. Uh, and this is an enormous job just getting the connections uh, in all these different countries to private and public sector and international uh, organizations. I would end just by saying I think we were extremely fortunate. And as any researcher will tell you, luck it plays a big role. I think it was important that we interviewed in China first because in the five years since uh, China, I think it's fair to say, has uh, tightened up on its accessibility to uh, interview research. So we got that out of the way early. And then on that basis, we interviewed extensively throughout Southeast Asia. So I want to invite my uh, colleague, uh, Selena Ho, to uh, carry on, and then she will be followed by uh, Professor Quick. Selena? Thank you, Mike. Um, I want to thank um, LKYSPP, my home institution, for hosting this, uh, Yunfeng for moderating this, and of course the events team, and uh, my students and um, who attend, who's attending, and obviously all the other uh, people with, who are in the audience who are you know in the, in, in the evening attending this this book launch. Um, let me start by saying that uh, let me let me start by saying that I'm taking off where Mike has left off to talk about the roles of uh, small states and, and what kind of things they can do, uh, whether they have bargaining power and uh, what kind of challenges uh, they pose when it comes to the construction of the railway itself. Now, uh, as we as students of IR theory, we have often, we have often been told that, you know, uh, small states have little agency. They're usually balancing or bandwagoning or hedging um, most of the time, but, um, in our book and in our research, uh, when we went on the ground, and obviously there are some theoretical um, uh, backing to this as well, smaller states do have agency. And it's very clear when we went on the ground in doing our research. Now, what are the things that small states can do? They can resist, they can modify, they can challenge, they can initiate a project. In fact, a lot of these projects are from initiated from the Southeast Asian sites, side to chi the Chinese. 
uh, they can negotiate and they can bargain. So let me let me talk about the three conditions that determine that determine the bit bargaining power of smaller states as they negotiate with China. Now the first condition is that size, wealth, and location matter. Uh, obviously, middle powers like Indonesia, like Thailand, like Malaysia, uh, and Singapore are uh, you know they have more leverage than say Laos when it comes to bargaining for better terms for themselves. For instance, Indonesia. Uh, was able to get the Chinese to agree to no sovereign guarantees for the project and a lower interest rate as well. Um, geography obviously gives Thailand a major advantage as you have seen in the map earlier on. Um, all the three different routes will actually pass through Thailand. So Thailand is in a very good position. In fact, in one of our interviews, a key government advisor described Thailand as a, in quotes, beautiful woman who can wait to choose the best suitor. Now, this is obviously referring, uh, suitors are referring to the great powers that come knocking at her doorsteps, at Thailand's doorsteps. Now, for Laos, geography is not an asset. It can be bypassed the east and the west. Uh, from, by, bypassed, uh, from the, from, it can be bypassed because you have Vietnam and Myanmar that the route can go through. Uh, in fact, our interviews, there was significant anxiety in Laos among Lao officials that they will be uh, bypassed. Now, the second condition that determines the bargaining power of smaller states is the level of state capacity these states have. Now, our secondary states obviously have more options when they have greater capacity, such as robust government institutions, civil society, rule of law, uh, human resources, and the ability to regulate and monitor. Now, Singapore has state capacity, capacity and is not overly dependent on China economically, for instance. However, countries like Laos are heavily reliant on the Chinese economy for technical expertise. For instance, the feasibility study of the china lao high-speed railway was actually conducted by the Chinese themselves. Now, the third condition for, for uh, allowing, uh, giving smaller states more bargaining power is domestic politics and public opinion. And these play a very huge role in determining um, how much bargaining power smaller states actually have. Now, Ching Chui will actually go into more details about this later on, but let me outline some key points here. Now, if we think of bargaining as a two-level game, this brings to my Robert Putnam's two-level game theory. Um, you, you, you have the first level, which is the international uh, bargaining level, okay, among all the different countries uh, and institutions, uh, international institutions. The second level is bargaining among domestic agencies. And this will include uh, the role of public opinion itself. And so leaders like Najib and Jokowi have been on tech for selling their countries to China. They are also concerned over whether locals will benefit in terms of job creation, uh, technological transfer, and, and also Chinese companies often bring, bring in their own labor and materials from into China. Uh, in a sense, this is sidelining a local labor and local SMEs. SMEs. There is thus a very big question on whether economics, uh, the economies of host countries actually benefit from these projects. So negative public opinion and unhappiness over Chinese presence can, can exert strong significant pressures on the leaders themselves. So if we come back to the two level theory at level two, the wind sets for Southeast Asian politicians are actually quite small. Now this ironically strengthens their bargaining power when they negotiate with China at level one, the international level. Meaning when they go to China, they can tell China, look, I'm putting my domestic position at stick here. You have to give me more concessions. Now that covers the bargaining power of uh, smaller states. Let me talk about the challenges of implementation. So as Chinese companies venture into South Asia, they encounter problems and issues which they are not familiar with when they operate uh, within their own country. There's a lot of trial and error and there's learning involved as well. Not that there are no problems when they implement their projects or construct their projects within China, but the problem multiply when these companies encounter different types of political systems. So imagining going to seven Southeast Asian countries with different political systems and with a very confusing array of actors and veto points. So for instance, uh, let me 
touch on the first point, decentralization and land acquisition. I'm referring to decentralization uh, politics in Indonesia, uh, and uh, especially when they are when when um, the companies are trying to Chinese companies are trying to acquire land in Indonesia. This is the first step of the process. The first step of construction involves land acquisition. So as a result of the, de the result of the delays in land acquisition, the project at this Jakarta Bandung. Uh, High speed rail has actually been delayed for several years. So let me explain. Uh, so, with decentralization pol politics and democratization post, post 1998 in Indonesia, the center has actually weakened while the region seas were strengthened. So, the Jakarta Bandung Railroad was, on, was an agreement be between Beijing and Jakarta with little consultation of local governments. So, when Chinese companies Try to acquire land from the local aid regencies, they encountered resistance. In total, there are 29 districts and 95 villages in West Java, which are directly impacted by the high speed rail construction. So you can imagine the amount of difficulties Chinese construction companies face as they deal with um, powerful local authorities and very strong land tenure laws, which favor regencies and private individuals in Indonesia. Now, let me talk about the second challenge to implementation, which is bureaucratic resistance. You see this in Thailand, for example, the State Railway Authority of Thailand makes money by selling land, but loses money on rail operations. So hence, compensation for the loss of land is a key issue during negotiations with the Chinese. There are also significant legal obstacles to the construction of the China-Thailand uh, high-speed railway, um, the, these are the laws that offer labor protection, uh, which sets procurement standards, uh, land usage and environmental protection laws. So these laws are good things, but in the process, uh, they can, uh, if you want to move things very quickly, they can slow things down. So this is what happened. These laws became a barrier to moving the China uh, Thailand high speed rail um, quickly along the way. Uh, so what happened was General Prayud, um, Prime Minister of Thailand, had to invoke an executive order to overcome these legal barriers. Now, um, the third point is that for any infrastructure project, and especially for those that cross borders, and, and this is usually the case with railroads, you have to have a champion. Uh, having a champion is actually really important. So in Malaysia, for instance, you have the former Prime Minister Najib as a very stalwart champion of the East Coast Rail Railing and the Kuala Lumpur Singapore High Speed Rail. However, when he lost power in May 2018, uh, to general elections, these projects lost a powerful patron. And we know what happened to the East Coast Railing. It was put on hold, even though it was under construction. Eventually, the government was, uh, the, the present government restarted the project after they negotiate better terms with with China. And obviously, um, the KL Singapore high speed rail has been in the papers recently, especially if you are in Singapore, you would have read about it. The project has uh, is now has been scuttled. Um, the uh, Malaysia has compensated Singapore for um, whatever costs that have been incurred on our part. So, you know, without a champion, some of these projects can just disappear or, or you know, or be or put on hold uh, overnight. Now, the, four, the fourth obstacles are actually more technical. So let's take Laos as, exam as an example. Now, if you're constructing a high-speed railway in Laos, if you're familiar with Laos, you know there are lots of rivers and, and mountains. It's a very mountainous area. It's a, so it's a very huge engineering project that requires tunneling through the mountains. So in fact, a total of 170 bridges and 72 tunnels are expected to be conducted. Moreover, in Laos, there are large amounts of unexploded mines remaining from the Indochina wars. In fact, one of the Chinese railway engineer uh, whom we met working on the project actually said, in quotes, we should, lead, we should ask, we should have the US demine the area, unquote. So in sum, there are significant challenges that uh, China experiences as it ventures into Southeast Asia, whether in terms of when they are negotiating terms of the contract or when they're constructing the high-speed railways themselves. Now, Ching Chui uh, will elaborate more on the diverse responses of Southeast Asian states to China, as well as the geopolitical and geoeconomics competition with other major powers. Over to you, Ching Chui. Um, thanks very much, Selena. Um, good evening or good morning to uh, everyone, depending on where you are. 
first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer, Lee Kuan Yew School, for hosting this event, and also to thank uh, Professor Kong for uh, moderating uh, this session. Um, as uh, what mentioned by Selena, and also uh, based on what uh, Mike has presented, I would uh, perform two tasks. First, I will uh, talk about the patterns of responses on the part of uh, small countries in Southeast Asia. And secondly, I would uh, touch upon the issue of geoeconomics and also a uh, geopolitical uh, uh, um, phenomenon uh, towards a uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative. So um, this diagram uh, before you, it's uh, in chapter four. We try to use this uh, two times two metrics to illustrate the how issue and also to explain the why issue. That is the four quadrants uh, that you are seeing, the four small boxes represent uh, the patterns of responses uh, on the part of uh, smaller countries. And then uh, the two variables that you could see uh, uh, along the two axis are uh, explanation that we try to uh, provide uh, in order to uh, help us make sense of uh, the very complex uh, patterns of uh, responses that we are observing from the project. So let me uh, first uh, highlight um, the quadrants uh, one and two, uh, those uh, representing the more receptive uh, type of responses compared to uh, quadrant three and four, less receptive and also uh, even uh, more cautious. So quadrant one is different from quadrant two in the sense that although uh, both are receptive, but the quadrant one, the example here is Laos, is uh, more stable, more enthusiastic, whereby a uh, quadrant two, even though receptive, but uh, it's uh, very fluctuating. There are lots of uh, cyclical recalibration um, because of a change of government or other dynamics that I shall uh, explain. And uh, this uh, quadrant two is really represented uh, by the case of uh, Malaysia. And these are all big uh, contrasts uh, compared to say, for example, three and four. For Vietnam, it's uh, very cautious. There is a very uh, limited uh, involvement vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, China's uh, Belt and Road, particularly uh, including uh, uh, the real project. And uh, similarly, and in fact, uh, quite surprisingly, for a case of uh, Thailand uh, representing a uh, quadrant three, uh, Thailand, despite the very uh, positive and also a stable diplomatic relations with China, has been uh, responded in a very selective and also a flexible engagement. We won't have time uh, to, uh, illest, to illustrate uh, all these examples, but very briefly, in the case of uh, Laos, you see that uh, although Laos take a few, took a few years from uh, 2010 after the signing of MOU to uh, 2016, December 2016, to have the groundbreaking uh, ceremony. But once the groundbreaking uh, ceremony was launched, we have seen steady, relatively steady and uh, smooth uh, implementation. And as we talk, the construction is still ongoing despite the COVID situation. And uh, Lao China High Speed Rail is going to be, uh, is scheduled to be completed by the end of this year. And this is going to be the first China-backed uh, HSR in Southeast Asia that is completed. And in the case of Malaysia, I think Selena mentioned that briefly, uh, during Najib, many uh, projects are ongoing, including uh, ECRL and uh, including also a Gamas JB a uh, uh, real project and also CRRC a uh, center in Batu Gaja. But once uh, we saw Mahadila 2.0 came to power in May uh, 2018, uh, he suspended uh, three out of uh, many projects, including uh, ECRL, for reasons that uh, I shall uh, briefly uh, touch upon uh, later on. And again, uh, about uh, let's contrast this with Vietnam. Vietnam, despite the proximity with China, we knew that uh, there is only uh, one small project, and that's a uh, urban real project in uh, Hanoi that has been uh, dragged on and also a delay for years. And the case of Thailand, the best uh, and representative uh, Belt and Road project is actually the one uh, um, from uh, Bangkok to Nong Kai. And there are two phases, only up to now, after almost uh, 30 over uh, rounds of negotiation, we knew that only phase one from Bangkok to Korat, there are some construction and also a contract uh, uh, going on. But phase two is uh, from Korat to Nong Kai is still uh, very much uh, ongoing. So you could see that all these are evidences that show there are different uh, responses on the part of uh, smaller countries in Southeast Asia. And even though we choose uh, only four countries here, they represent uh, similar patterns that can be uh, uh, that can be observed and also a parallel either within Southeast Asia or beyond. And uh, maybe a next slide please, uh, Selena. So what explain uh, uh, these uh, different uh, patterns? Um, we certainly believe that the domestic politics uh, play a big part. 
And then uh, particularly, there is a one major domestic politics that are very dominant, which is a legitimation. And by that, we refer to ruling elites, a quest for winning the hearts and minds of uh, the constituency. There are three types of uh, legitimation. So the first type, which is the most dominant one, it's a uh, uh, performance legitimation, the economic growth uh, based and also a uh, development based uh, performance type of uh, legitimation. And clearly all ASEAN countries, some more so than others, all ruling elites in Southeast Asia rely on performance legitimation. Laos and Malaysia, Cambodia, so on and so forth, certainly have belonged to this uh, category. But this is not the only pathway of legitimation. As uh, you could see from this slide, there are other types of pathways that might uh, counteract or even uh, offset the importance of performance legitimation. For example, particularistic and also procedural legitimation. Particularistic legitimation refers to uh, some kind of like anti-China, for example, anti-China nationalism. So this is the big uh, factor in the case of uh, Vietnam, that uh, why Vietnam, despite the relevancy of a uh, performance legitimation, but the anti-China particularistic legitimation has uh, offset and constrained and limited the, uh, the extent to which Vietnamese elites uh, could go and also collaborate with China when it comes to uh, Belt and Road. Uh, in the case of Thailand, uh, performance legitimation, very important. Uh, and particularistic uh, legitimation is also relevant here, but it takes different form. It is not anti-China, but more about the Thai identity. So uh, during a few many Thai elites that we talked about, very strong a sense of uh, emphasizing that certain projects, right? For example, EEC is not China, it's not Belt and Road project, but it is a Thai project. And uh, similarly for uh, the North South uh, Bangkok the Nong Kai project, uh, Thai uh, elite to emphasize that this is Thailand. We will do things in Thai way. So uh, Thai identity clearly offset the importance of a performance legitimation. Finally, procedural legitimation, we refer to democratic base and so on and so forth. And this is the basis where Mahadeva decided to act upon because of uh, he uh, came during his campaign uh, in 2018 uh, election, he promised uh, to suspend this kind of controversial pro uh, projects. And then uh, he has the uh, mandate to actually push forward, push back, and also uh, requested for uh, suspension. And with that, uh, let me move on uh, to uh, the issue of uh, uh, um, another domestic uh, reason that uh, why uh, we have uh, seen a different type of uh, uh, responses. Uh, Selena, please, uh, the next uh, slide. Yeah, here. So as I mentioned, uh, legitimation is only uh, uh, one big uh, factor, but it is uh, uh, also being um, inter interfere, intervene by uh, the other type of uh, domestic uh, factor. And this is uh, what we call as pluralization. It's a variable that uh, we uh, know uh, Mike, uh, my teacher Mike, has uh, elaborated a lot in his earlier work, but in the case of uh, China particularly. So here we apply uh, this variable pluralization to what extent power is being uh, centralized across uh, uh, among state, state elites, but also uh, between state and also society. So this is the variable the explanation that uh, makes sense to help us to make sense. Why, for example, uh, Malaysia and Laos are equally receptive, but Malaysia is more fluctuated because of there is a bottom up uh, that dynamics because of uh, the power uh, pluralization is uh, much higher in the case of uh, Malaysia. Similarly, in the case of uh, comparing Thailand and Vietnam, Vietnam is a uh, uh, communist and also a one party uh, uh, state. And hence, uh, the elite's decision is uh, relatively uh, stable, uh, just like in the case of uh, Laos. But Thailand, because of the uh, power decentralization and also pluralistic uh, aspect of uh, the Thai uh, politics, despite the under military uh, government, uh, we could see, uh, still see the dynamics in which uh, things are relatively more selective and also uh, flexible. And with that, uh, let me move on to uh, the, the final uh, issue that we are going to uh, uh, discuss, which is about the geoeconomics and also uh, geopolitical uh, dynamics. So here, uh, we actually uh, like uh, uh, one quote that we gathered from one of our interviews uh, in Thailand. So one of the well-respected uh, Thai elites uh, have a very good way of uh, helping us to uh, contextualize the whole uh, phenomenon of real road project in uh, uh, this part of a region. He described uh, the dynamics as regional connectivity as a process of dynamic 
and overlapping uh, circles. So it's not just one circle. It's not just about Belt and Road. Before, well before Belt and Road, there are many circles in the sense that at the national circle, and we can see also the ASEAN base or sub-regional or even uh, things that uh, involve uh, ADB. So this has been ongoing and then a BRI just added another layer of circle. And uh, before we move on to uh, compare uh, some competing uh, powers uh, initiative uh, that try to project themselves as some kind of alternative to a Belt and Road. It is uh, worth uh, spend uh, one, two minutes to uh, talk about Singapore coming reeling that I might mention uh, earlier on very briefly. And this is very telling, and we actually described that uh, quite lengthy in uh, Chapter 7 for various reasons. Number one, to show that uh, regional connectivity, even on real, actually started on the part of ASEAN countries, not China. So it started back in 1995, well before Belt and Road. Secondly, we also uh, use this example to showcase that 20 over years after Singapore coming reeling uh, ASEAN-led initiative proposed by Mahadeo back in 1995, 20 over years after uh, this uh, proposal and uh, partial uh, implementation, the project has not gone too far. There are still uh, lots of uh, missing link, and then uh, some part of uh, real road in uh, certain ASEAN countries have not been uh, double tracked. So that shows the limitation on the part of ASEAN countries to do this kind of uh, real connectivity by ourselves. And hence, regional partnerships is a necessity. China's Belt and Road provided the needed uh, uh, resources and also technology know-how that are uh, required and demanded by ASEAN countries. But clearly there are other factors, other actors that are in very much in picture. Japan, for example, is a long-standing uh, regional uh, partnership uh, in terms of uh, infrastructural uh, uh, building. So, but the difference here is that before 2015, before uh, uh, China actually um, uh, launched uh, Belt and Road in 2013, Japan's motive in uh, infrastructure development in the region is very much joint economics. But after 2013, 2015, because of Belt and Road, Japan's role has been uh, driven primarily by geopolitics, which is to compete and push back the China, uh, so that uh, China's influence will not be uh, uh, too huge and also uh, too widespread. And the tool that Japan has been doing is through this uh, initiative of partnership for quality infrastructure launched in uh, 2015. Interestingly, Japan uh, has not been uh, doing that just alone, but also uh, together with uh, some like-minded countries, either bilaterally, trilaterally, or even uh, in terms of uh, quad. So US and EU are the, uh, in a way, some emerging actors that try to uh, put more emphasis and also uh, efforts in this uh, regard. So 2018 was a critical year. US uh, passed the Build Act, uh, and the same year, EU also passed the EU Asia Connectivity Strategy. And more recently, in 2019, we know that uh, um, uh, US, Japan, and also Australia push forward the so-called Blue Dot Network, and they later on uh, also uh, get uh, India on board to some extent. And whether or not uh, this trend will be extended to a uh, quad plus or even uh, other countries remain to be seen. And uh, with that, I think I would uh, end my presentation. Thanks very much. Back to you, Vincent. Thank you. Thank you very much for three uh, scintillating uh, presentations and uh, summaries of uh, some of the main themes uh, of the book. So uh, in the uh, minutes that we have left, uh, probably we have about, let me see, about half an hour, slightly less than half an hour left. Um, perhaps we could go to the questions. I have three questions uh, from uh, the audience and maybe we can uh, start with that. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll add one or two of my own later if there's time. But I would like very much to invite our audience to continue uh, typing in your questions under your Q&A uh, uh, link. All right. So the first question from TT uh, is, uh, with the potential civil war or uh, turmoil in uh, Burma, uh, Myanmar, how would this affect ASEAN's trade as a whole and China's BRI in ASEAN? Would, uh, who would like to uh, take this question? So this is about Myanmar and uh, effect, impact on ASEAN's trade and China's uh, uh, BRI in Southeast Asia. Mike, you look like you are. Well, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, okay. Good questions and my colleagues, uh, particularly the aspect of trade, but uh, I guess I would start out by uh, COVID has certainly been a tragic, enormous impact all over the world. Uh, and uh, so we, we would have expected, I think, that it have uh, major impacts. 
But uh, China, if you look at Chinese growth and well, Chinese trade is is going up. Chinese exports are going up. China just had its um, uh, National People's Congress. It it lowballed its expectation for growth uh, this year and uh, in to six percent. But most Chinese I talk to expect six, seven, maybe even eight uh, percent growth. In fact, so. I, I don't want to say uh, COVID has had less impact than you might have expected, but I think uh, that's a good place to begin your uh, analysis. I think uh, one of my colleagues also said that the road through Laos uh, was not really affected. The pace of construction is still the same completion date down to Vientiane as they started. Now, Burma was less um, advanced in terms of negotiations and so forth, uh, and is a very complicated and under best circumstances was going to take uh, uh, a long time in, in any event. Uh, but we'll have to see how it works out. What we, we mentioned in terms of implementation is that domestic turmoil, whether it's because of elections or coup, every domestic change produces a new negotiating dynamic. So I would say the coup and disorder in Myanmar probably slows things down, uh, but it'll be the uh, sort of imp political instability perhaps uh, than, the, uh, than the economic effects of, of COVID and so forth. Uh, I would just point out too that it, the uh, pro in Myanmar, the pro uh, railroad kind of constituency isn't just the military. When Aung San Suu Kyi was playing a major role, she was also interested in these projects because saw it as a development. So I, I would say there's a constituency for rail construction that doesn't just break down military, yes, and civilians or Democrats, no. This are, there's a development logic as well, and that applies in Myanmar. So. I think it was always going to be slow going through Myanmar just because of the complexity and uh, so forth. But I, I don't think that we ought to attach undue importance to the current political upset other than it'll probably delay it. But my colleagues might have a different view. No, I, I think so, because uh, we, we, we saw the burning of the Chinese factories, right, and the reaction from the Chinese. So you can imagine what's happening with uh, Chinese businesses. So. Um, uh, in, in the case of, of uh, Myanmar, it, it, the Belt and Road Initiative will probably be stalling until, you know, I think all economic, um, economic um, progress or growth or economic development in, in the country is, is going to slow down. The economy is slowing down um, and maybe perhaps even coming to a standstill because of the, of the coup and the disorder that's happening there. I just would say, would you agree, though, Selena, that it wasn't moving very fast before? I agree with you. Uh, things were on stop. I mean, you look at the dam, the the, uh, the dam that was on on hold, because there were all these anger and and, and protests against Chinese infrastructure projects in Myanmar in the right. first. So it's already there. Um, the disorder would probably slow it down more, but you know, the the resistance to China and Chinese businesses were already there in the beginning. Right. I think just uh, Myanmar is a fascinating case. Uh, and of course, you have actors like the military in China that have provided weapons to forces in northeast Burma. And the, the, the Myanmar military is not always that happy with China either. It's not just simply that the military likes China and uh, the civilians don't. So I guess, in a sense, I, I, you're quite right to point out to all of the anger that's been directed at, uh, at Chinese enterprises in Myanmar has been a noble, notable feature. So I, I think Myanmar is going to be pretty difficult, was going to be pretty difficult. Uh, that doesn't mean impossible, but it means taking a longer time, if ever. And certainly the recent developments that have slowed it down. But I think there's an important point, and that is that in all this turmoil, the Chinese economy keeps growing, and they have resources and they have um, incentives, and so uh, you know they can't override the reality on the ground in these countries. But 
uh, they, they will certainly have the ability to move if the local conditions permit. Yeah. Injury, do you want to come in or should we go to the next question? Yeah, very quick one. Um, okay. Just a very three uh, quick points. Number one is that uh, um, the nature of uh, China Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, in Southeast Asia is actually bilateral in nature. So meaning that what is going on in Myanmar would not affect uh, the China's uh, infra Belt and Road the infrastructure projects elsewhere in the region. That's point number one. Point number two is that uh, looking at the long run, uh, long term trend, China ASEAN relation, uh, China ASEAN trade uh, has been uh, on has been growing steadily and also uh, quite robust. Last year, uh, for the first time, uh, ASEAN overtook the uh, EU as the uh, China's uh, trading partner uh, number one, and this uh, trend is likely to continue. And then uh, the third point, uh, finally, is that uh, I think uh, as uh, things are the uncertainty is uh, growing in Myanmar, I think there are lots of uh, prediction as to the Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, progress in the country might uh, become a tool for the coup leader actually to negotiate with China. I, uh, there are some rumors uh, saying that, uh, for example, uh, the Mitsong uh, uh, Dam project, for example, might become a, a bargaining uh, chip uh, on the part of uh, uh, the military government vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, China, but this is uh, yet to be seen. Thank you. Okay, we are beginning to have uh, more and more questions uh, filtering in. So what I'm going to do is to try to do some sort of organizing of the questions in a way that speaks to some of the things that uh, our panelists uh, have talked about. So I'm going to jump, uh, you know, uh, questions and not necessarily uh, uh, post them in the order that we receive. I thought uh, it might be good to start with a question from uh, Nathan Company, where we says that I've heard much about China using BRI to make participating countries dependent on China. Some accuse China of deliberating, deliberately creating debt traps for countries in Africa so that they'll be under China's control. Based on your research and studies, how much of these accusations are, are valid? Or is it just another Western conspiracy theory along the lines of uh, containment? Anyone wants to uh, tackle this one? One of my yeah. colleagues. Yep. Uh, well, I, I'll take a stab at it, and then my colleagues can uh, uh, adjust what I say in light of uh, their understanding of reality. Uh, I think the first thing, and that this is in the chapter in the book, Vision, I think China, uh, broadly speaking, the, the force, the intellectual framework behind is that China will do better in a region that is prospering, urbanizing, uh, connecting to each other. Uh, and I think China sort of signs on to the World Bank study on connectivity as a strategy for development, both within countries and between countries. So I think China has no uh, attempt. Uh, Ch China really would, I think, see it in its interest to see these areas grow rapidly because it's a rapidly growing middle class, uh, rapidly rising income levels. Uh, it's a place where China can offload its production chains and so on. So you mentioned, uh, Professor Kung, is it a, a Western conspiracy theory? Not entirely if you look at it from the viewpoint of some arrangements have not been very financially sustainable, and Sri Lanka is often brought up as an example in that regard. But the outcome of a, a policy isn't necessarily reflect the intention. So I don't think China's trying to create kind of a, a, a dependence and insolvency so that it can dominate. I think it sees a, 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 a strong connectivity and strong economic growth to be in its interest. But the fact of the matter is China still, and Laos might be a good case of a very small GDP, very small population, assuming a huge amount of debt. But at the same time you question Chinese judgment, you have to also understand why the Laos are willing to do that. And each of these countries is willing to do it to a less or a greater extent. Laos very much willing to, or at least uh, compelled to uh, assume large debt, but Thailand decided to finance itself rather than ha not and not have that debt. So I think each of these countries is its own case, but. No, I don't think China has an attempt, uh, is attempting to just create debt trap diplomacy. Uh, we talked, or at least I talked to one person in connect, a Chinese in connection with the Sri Lanka case, the port of Hambantota, 
uh, where the Chinese loaned a lot of money. It wasn't solvent. China had to take it over for 99 years as compensation for the default on the loan. As one Chinese said, you know, this isn't in our interest. The reason that Hanbon Toda folded uh, financially is because it was losing money. There was no port, there were no ships of consequence coming through. Why would China want to have a port with no traffic for 99 years? So, you know, the Chinese also have different actors uh, there. The Navy might be happy with Hanbon Toda, but the banks, uh, the Chinese banks might not be. So there's a complicated politics in each of these different countries. There's complicated politics in China. And not all things that go wrong, even with respect to Chinese policy, are because of some big conspiracy. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Selena and Ching Chui, anything you want to add quickly? Or should we proceed to the next question? Ching Chui? Yeah, I think the issue of uh, whether and uh, to what extent uh, um, there will be a debt trap uh, uh, issue, I think depends on uh, many factors, but two are the more important one. One is about the uh, financing uh, mode. Um, I think Mike uh, touched upon uh, earlier on. If uh, it is loan, I think uh, there is a um, case of, uh, there is a risk of uh, that, that debt trap issue. But secondly, if it is involved investment, and uh, I don't think uh, the investment, and especially if uh, it is on the, uh, the second factor, which is uh, depending on, the uh, detail of the partnership. For example, if it's a 60-40 or 50-50 or 70-30 a partnership on the part of uh, the host country and China, that kind of uh, asymmetric uh, partnership might result in the risk of a uh, dependency and also if it is involving a loan and uh, we might see uh, the chances for uh, that trap. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Which is that I think that when you say that trap, it, it suggests that it's deliberate and that it's not something that happened as a result of uh, unintended consequences. Uh, I think Mike was just talking about that. I mean, this is not deliberate because uh, there are two points to this. One is that a lot of these countries actually go into it, realizing that they're going to be in debt. So in a way, it's not a trap. Uh, if it's a trap, they're walking into it willingly with their eyes wide open, knowing what this will entail. You can see that in Laos. They know that they're going to be in debt, but they're willing to do it because as the words of some of the the people that we met, the officials that we met, you know, if we don't do this, then we got to lose a lot of, we, we don't take a risk, we're going to lose it. We, we're not going to progress, we're not going to grow, our people are not going to be reach uh, the performance legitimacy part of the government, or the Laos government, right? And the other point is that um, I think that a lot of these debts are going to come back to the Chinese system, the Chinese banking system. The other ones are going to bear the cost if they, are if they are defaults and they are bad debts. You can see all these when bank officials actually come up and and, and one of that, they, 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 these debts are not sustainable. And as a result of these, these worries, you actually see the Chinese have been more careful when they are doling out the debts. They, in fact, they held back some debts, uh, some, some loans uh, to, uh, to, um, to Laos. So these, these, are, these are really just, uh, this shows you that, you know, is, there's no debt trap. Um, and and th there's no such thing a Western conspiracy theory that this is, a China containment strategy accusing China of debt trap. Because I think that um, this is something that newspapers, pundits, you know, and, and, and media blows, makes it, blows it up. I think these kind of stories sell lines. And especially in, in this day and age with when being entered China in the Western press is actually, you know, something that will uh, garner you a lot of support and attention, right? So I, I think we must be wary of these kind of terms. Thank you, Yuan Feng. Thank you. Right. I yeah. Just say one, one other thing, and I agree with everything my colleagues have said, is there's a chapter in the book in, called Debates, and it's Debates in China. And what I would point out is, and particularly Tsinghua University is a good example, uh, there's a lot of opinion in China that China itself is overextending. Why is China building railroads in Laos when the, China has an aging population, social security? Healthcare, uh, domestic infrastructure in China still needs a lot of work. Uh, so there is a debate in China about whether China's been way too liberal, uh, too, we might say, generous or unwise in its commitments abroad. One person walked into my office one day and says, We've got a leader who every country stops in, he promises $50 billion, and we can't uh, keep up with it. So I guess what we're saying is that these are real places with real constraints 
with real debates. Thank you, Mike. Okay, let's bring in COVID. Terence Lee has a question. Has COVID changed China's BRI calculus? And for Southeast Asian states, has the pandemic and China's assertiveness in the South China Sea altered the country's receptiveness to BRI? I think the latter question is for probably Ching Chui on uh, receptiveness. And then uh, maybe BRI calculus and COVID, Selena? Sounds like something you have uh, talked about, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So, so let me say that uh, with the respect to COVID and whether it's actually the BRI, uh, not really, as Mike mentioned, um, the Laos project actually went ahead after um, 20, 20 over days of delay and they are on schedule, right, to be completed by the end of this year. Uh, they are on schedule. The schedule didn't change. And uh, in the Thai case, they, they you know, despite that the, the, the construction is actually really, the actual construction is only a very strong, small stretch right now. And COVID did uh, some of these delays, but then, you know, they went on and negotiate the next stage, the next phase of the, of the, of the China, Thailand high-speed rail. Uh, all the way to the, to the northern border um, with Laos. So they actually went on to negotiate the next stage. Similarly, in the Indonesia case, after short delays, they went on and continued again with the construction. Um, you know? So as far as I can tell, COVID really has not really changed China's BRI calculus. Uh, it has progressed. Um, there's, of course, the, the talk about dual circulation strategy right now, which suggests that the Chinese are turning towards focusing on on the on the on the on the economy uh, uh, internally, domestic consumption and and things internal to China instead of investing so much energy on investments and BRI outside. There's this suggestion, but I don't think that that in any way. I think that's more for a domestic audience than anything. I think there are a few factors um, which will impact on China's BRI calculus. This one one it is uh, really relevant to Xi Jinping's legitimate uh, legacy. It is something that he will want to succeed. So regardless of what people say or, or what is the official rhetoric, China cannot be seen to fail when it comes to BRI. The other factor is that the, hung, the region, Southeast Asia, is still hungry for infrastructure. In fact, the whole of Asia is, and the developing parts of the world is. So this kind of hunger is not going to go away because COVID is going to be there. So in that sense, um, you know, BRI as, a, as not going to happen or, or disappearing, I don't think that's going to happen. There may be changes and evolution to it, but it's not going to go away. Cheng Chui, do you want to uh, tackle the question on whether uh, the pandemic and China's assertiveness in the South China Sea might have changed the country's receptiveness to BRI? Yeah, I, I think there are uh, a number of uh, factors that are at play. So number one is that um, the US-China competition. So uh, the decoupling that you mentioned, uh, Yun Fong, uh, early on during the outset, I think certainly determine uh, China's actually determination, uh, deepen uh, China's determination uh, to push internally, push for dual circulation, and uh, externally actually to continue uh, what has been uh, going on at the regional uh, level. And uh, it has been a uh, true primarily, uh, I would say, contradictory approaches. One is that uh, economically, the economic inducement through Belt and Road and diplomatic uh, negotiation will uh, continue to uh, deepen. As we talk, actually, we know that uh, several ASEAN countries, uh, foreign ministers are in uh, China for a uh, negotiation. So this thing, I think, will continue at the same time when the contradictory approach of maritime assertiveness will continue, primarily because of uh, all these external approaches are the extension of uh, China's own performance legitimation, but also uh, China's own na nationalistic uh, legitimation. And uh, by nature, it has to be a contradictory uh, uh, action. So we are the receiving ends. We uh, cannot uh, stop uh, China to do uh, more assertiveness, and which is why I think the external uh, powers uh, role will be a uh, very, very critical. What the US, what the Quad members are doing, uh, it's uh, in a way welcomed by ASEAN countries uh, as a smaller countries. But at the other, at the same time, we are also getting uh, more nervous that uh, this growing uh, balancing uh, dynamics might result in uh, the risk of uh, entrapment. Yeah. And this is a situation that I think uh, we have been in, and uh, it's uh, growing uh, by day, primarily because of uh, what is going on between US and China. Okay. I, I think. I think. Oh, uh, come on in. Just, uh, I think uh, Chung Chui had an excellent point there. I would say in the book, uh, we talk about, if you think about it, connectivity requires a certain amount of confidence 
because you're hooking up more intimately in more dimensions to China about which you have economic desires for gain, but you have security fears in terms of dependence. And so I uh, think, and we emphasize in the book that often Chinese foreign policy is working against uh, creating the confidence uh, that the uh, the partner states or potential partners need. And so particularly you find a, a certain, a higher degree of resistance on maritime states where the maritime states have some conflicts either over ocean space uh, EEZs or, or even territorial claims. And so, yes, I think China's security behavior works against its economic statecraft uh, and China, I think, would be better off uh, reassuring people in its foreign policy. It would also help its economic statecraft. Thank you. Uh, we are running out of time uh, with about six, seven minutes left. So what I'm going to do is uh, to uh, bring up one last question, uh, which is probably something that is very much on uh, quite a number of people's minds uh, in the audience, including mine. After all has been said and done, uh, Selena, Cheng Chui, Mike, do you think the BRI railway project in Southeast Asia will be successful? This is a question from uh, Yong Bing Tan, right? So given all that you have analyzed, if you were to wager whether it will be an ultimate success, what would you say? One minute each uh, as a sort of your wrap up statement too, and then I will close the proceedings. Uh, perhaps Cheng Chui, you want to start? Do you yeah, think very yeah, Bing Tang wants to know whether you think whether you think it will be ultimately successful. I guess uh, it depends on uh, what do we measure uh, success. If we are measuring a success in terms of uh, we are going to see some transformation, some changes on ground. I think uh, we are we have already been seeing that uh, what is going on in Laos, for example, uh, is a clear example. Uh, it's uh, and I, as I mentioned early on, uh, the Lao China Railroad is going to be completed uh, by the end of this year. We are also seeing uh, something uh, similar, but partially, not as uh, pro progressive, uh, on the part of uh, what is going on in Malaysia and even in uh, Indonesia. Even though selective, but you do know that uh, Jakarta Bandung are making a uh, progress. So we might uh, not seeing very fast uh, all roads uh, leads to China, uh, but we are going to see more and more lines and dots are going to be uh, linked to. Uh, China in one way or another through a different kind of a connectivity. Whether or not that is a success, depending on whether what uh, have been happening on ground will be a spill over and create the kind of a desired the developmental uh, impact that uh, has been uh, talked about by ruling elites of the day. Thank you. Selena? Oh, Yong Beng is actually my student. Hi, Yong Beng. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, uh, so this, um, let me say that, let me add to what uh, Ching Chi said, I mean, it really it depends. It depends on whose viewpoint. Is it China's viewpoint? Did China achieve the strategic goals and economic goals that it wanted, right? Its economic goals is to export its excess capacity. Its strategic goals is to exercise influence, to develop its influence in Southeast Asia, right? So this is to, to, that, that is one thing, right? So to develop a system where it is the center of connectivity in Southeast Asia. So that's from the Chinese viewpoint. I mean, if the, from the Southeast Asia viewpoint, there is the other viewpoint, the Southeast Asian countries. What is it that Southeast Asian countries want? They are hungry for infrastructure. So infrastructure is a source of growth for them. Growth legitimizes them. So it really depends on how you want to measure this. And it really depends on whose viewpoint you're looking at. So I'm not answering your question uh, directly, Yongbing. I'm setting you the conditions to look at uh, how you measure these levels of success. Um, but if you see that, you know, if China succeeds in exercising over a greater influence in South Asia because of this project, then I would say that it's relatively successful, right? But it is still in the stage of building. The results are not going to be known for quite a while because these projects, these infrastructure projects, railroad projects take a long time to be built and to see results. Uh, from the Chinese, from the angle of the, of the Southeast Asian countries, Success, would it result, if, if, if these projects succeed, do, does it mean that the, the, the economy will grow? Will it enhance the legitimacy of the leaders? Uh, again, it's something that is going to be years to come. We're not going to be able to see it that clearly. And does it mean that they're going to be over, overly reliant on China now? So we really don't know. 
we have to see all these factors coming to play. Mike, your turn. My, 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 my student yeah. and my, my teacher here. <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, I think uh, what my colleagues have said is is correct. It depends who's assessing and when. That's, I think, the basic answer. But I'd, I'd frame it a little differently. And I would say, quote, success is not only in the minds of the holder, but it's like a, a light rheostat. It's not an on-off switch. Success, failure. There's a spectrum there. It's like a rheostat. You can... The light can be brighter or less bright. My own guess is that um, I think if you look at it, it's just three potential lines. I think the odds of getting to Bangkok uh, from the China border through Laos are very high by the end of this um, decade. Probably sooner, but I think the odds are high to get to Bangkok. And if just that happens, I think it will be a big transformation, not only for Southeast Asia, but Thailand and its potential. Uh, and it will also be a major achievement for China. So I would say if they get to Bangkok, this is going to be a big transformational objective, even if the others uh, lines take uh, considerably longer or maybe in some cases never or at least not anytime soon ever get completed. Uh, also, the other thing to think about is this is all driving the development of Chinese industry. Uh, this is like, uh, for China, the high-speed rail industry is like Boeing was for the United States. It drove all the supplier industries and so on. So success isn't just whether they all get built according to the map we put up, but it's how it's driving Chinese industry, research and development and so on. So I guess that uh, I would say, I think the odds of this being transformational within China and in, with its region are high, but the degree of which it occurs and the speed with which it occurs uh, is open to debate. Thank you, Mike. Uh, as you can see, uh, our authors of uh, Rivers of Iron have given a very systematic and thorough thoughts uh, to, uh, you know, uh, the uh, issue of uh, the extent to which uh, one can uh, brand, you know, uh, the railway system a success uh, or not. And I think that brings us uh, close, uh, very close to the end of uh, this wonderful uh, session. And uh, I was given five minutes to make closing remarks. I think I'll cut it off. Uh, cut off my closing remarks by uh, three minutes, but I do want to say, uh, 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 do, do want to share some final uh, thoughts. Uh, I think this book is a very important, timely and rich contribution to our understanding of uh, China's rising power, uh, China's Southeast Asian relations and the BRI. And just taking off from something that Mike said in the beginning, if we see the uh, uh, era ahead of us, the next decade or two, as a time of uh, intensifying US-China strategic rivalry, I think the general consensus is that the locus of that rivalry is going to be in Asia. And within Asia, uh, I think many of us think that it is uh, Southeast Asia and there's alignments which will be particularly up for grabs, uh, in part because uh, most of the uh, countries in Northeast Asia, their alignments are already pretty well known. But uh, it is in Southeast Asia that I think the struggle will be the uh, you know, most intense and uh, where the action is in that sense. And that's why this book is so important because uh, by looking at railways as an example of infrastructure power, I think uh, the three authors through their fantastic field work drills deep into the issue and allows us to go beyond, you know, platitudes about, oh, you know, uh, they will align according to ideology or economic interests, but to tell us to look at the varied responses, the agency that each of uh, the states uh, have, some have more, some have less to be sure, uh, the implementation challenges and so on. I think they, the book provides us with an extremely rich nuance or superior analysis uh, of the uh, importance of uh, infrastructure, how it uh, you know enhances or, or mitigates uh, China's power in the region. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike, Selina, and Cheng Chui, for you know enriching our discourse and our understanding uh, of the issue. And to the audience, uh, thank you so much 
for engaging uh, our authors, uh, you know, at this time of the day, wherever uh, you are. And for those, to those who we did not get to your questions, I apologize given the limited time, but we are really, really grateful that you took the time to join us. So with that, uh, I will uh, leave uh, uh, the next step uh, to the events team. And uh, really, is there anything that uh, we need to uh, share with the audience? Uh, I, I think that uh, the, the link for purchasing the book is actually... Already there? Yeah, it's already there. So, okay, um, good. So uh, go buy the book, all right? Just, I would have bought it just by reading the table of contents, uh, as I suggested uh, early on, all right? So, thank you, everyone. Good thank night. you. All right. Thank you, Professor Kong. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye